Hey guys, welcome to the Wikia Expert Showcase. I'm Philip Asher from Trendy Entertainment. I'm going to be telling you about Dungeon Defenders 2. Thanks for the question. So there's a ton of things that we're implementing in Dungeon Defenders 2 to increase replay value. Uh, one of the things that we are, I'll, I'll tell you guys about two things right now, a lot of it's still under wraps. One thing is that the mission selection isn't going to be the same from the first game. It's not going to simply be a list of missions that you pick and replay over and over again. It's actually going to be a kind of ebb and flow where the community gets to decide uh, which maps people play on and that's going to change the game in some way which I can't announce yet. Another example is actually our tower and ability and tower and tower synergy systems that we're implementing. This is going to create thousands of more ways to play a map. Uh, so I'm excited for you guys to try it out. So we were developing Dungeon Defenders 2 as a MOBA for a couple of months and our team learned a lot. Um, I think the most important thing that we learned was that we didn't know how to work as a 50 or 60 person studio. We only knew how to work as a 14 person studio. So we actually hired producers from other studios and kind of organized around and for the first time ever actually wrote game design documents. and and had these processes that actually let us create something that was good. And, and we took our experience from kind of having a, a messiness that was the game we were working on to being able to produce uh, what you're seeing now that we're revealing uh, that's very refined. And that's something that we're really excited to bring to you guys. So story is going to play a big role in the Dungeon Defenders 2 experience. But the story is actually going to influence the gameplay itself. So one of the core pillars of the project that we're working on is that the action, the tower defense, and the role playing of Dungeon Defenders 2 are combined. In the first game, we felt like we didn't do the greatest job. We had a, a action phase, the combat phase, we had a defense phase, the build phase, and then when you're in the tavern, you bought pets, you leveled up, everything was separated. We're trying to combine it all together. So I'll give you an example of how story is influencing uh, Dungeon Defenders 2. And the map we're showing on the floor at Comic-Con, you're actually defending the castle from the first game from the old ones. Now, you're not just defending Eternia Crystals anymore. The old ones are actually attacking the main gate locks, and you have to protect them or they'll get into the castle. So there's actually now sub-objectives. So these are the east and west gate locks. If these fall, you don't lose the level, because the story is they're trying to get into the castle. But they'll actually open up additional lanes that you'll have to defend the main gate against. So um, I can't really talk about a lot of these things right now, but we are announcing Dungeon Defenders 2 for PC, Mac, and Linux. And I'll say that our team is probably as or more excited than all of you for the next generation consoles. Uh, we love the free-to-play support that they're talking about. It's definitely something that we want to look into given the right opportunity. Our approach to level design has changed drastically from the first game to the second game. One thing is that we're actually adding in environmental traps now. These will affect your defense layouts because you may want to use them as a last resort against the enemy. So it's a large incentive to not turtle around a spawn point because you know the dynamite explosion that's going to take out eight armored orcs in one hit is actually you know somewhere else on the map and you're going to want to lead enemies there so you can use that environmental trap. The trait system is doing wonders for the map layout so when things that are frozen get dealt smashing damage they get destroyed instantly. So the monk actually has an ability called Chi Blast which is force push. He pushes and enemies fall off the ledge. So now if you set up your frost towers correctly then a monk character could actually play running through the level force pushing frozen enemies off of ledges. So this is actually giving us a lot more opportunities to be creative and play with verticality in ways that are actually going to impact gameplay. What we're actually trying to do is create enemies that challenge you both strategically and from an action perspective. We want during the combat phase players to uh, come together and have to fight off certain enemies and really think about things. So one example now is the Wyvern, right? The Wyvern used to follow along a specific path and do specific actions. But now we've given them more dynamic in AI. They actually hover around the top of the map and look for, look for defenses that are least defended from air and then swarm down and attack those to really force players to go to a specific area of the map and take out the Wyverns. A very specific example is we're working on an enemy now which actually has something we call cluster targeting. This enemy actually searches the map for your largest, most expensive cluster of defenses. And when they find it, they'll burrow beneath the defenses, weakening them. 
So it's a kind of rush. This enemy is very rare and very powerful. And when it spawns, if you guys don't find it before it clusters, your defenses will be significantly weakened until you can take it out. I mean, at least in the office, the trace system has drastically changed how we approach the game. I think the main thing is that in the first game, people often found a build that worked best for a level, and they stuck with that build. Part of the idea of the trace system is to make that not so much the case. So in this way, let's say you got a sword that dealt frost damage. And let's say you got a ridiculous legendary one that froze every enemy it hit. You know, I'm not saying that will exist, but just theoretically if that happened, that could completely change how you play a level. Because maybe you want to play with uh, your squire friend and he's only going to place cannonball turrets everywhere on the level. And the idea is that you know, you're going to run around and you're going to freeze all the enemies with your sword and then the cannonball turret is going to take them out in one hit. So I think that the trace system is going to completely change and give different options of setups and there won't be as much of, as the first game, a default setup. Some other ways that we're really differentiating the game is we've improved the melee and the ranged combat system. We like the first day of the first game, the melee system was uh, the lawnmower effect. You just kind of whacked and slashed enemies. It was like Dynasty Warriors. So we're actually implementing a root motion in the sequel. There are combos, there are air attacks, there are like more ways to interact with the enemies. There's knockback, there's uh, a lot more of a challenge and a little bit of skill. It's still hack and slash, but maybe more fun and reaction in the combat phase. For ranged combat, we've actually added headshots and headshots stun enemies and do different damage. So now it matters where you aim. We're trying to remove a little bit of the, oh, I'm shooting into an amorphous blob effect the first game could have at later levels and still have there be some strategy and skill involved in those phases. In going with the fact that we want action, tower defense, and role playing to all be equal, we've actually completely changed the resource system from the first game. So the first game only had mana and you had to decide, do I want to upgrade a tower? Do I want to repair a tower? Do I want to place a new tower? Do I want to use an ability? And often you could only pick one of those choices. So in the sequel we've actually split the ability resource and the defense resource. So now you don't have to choose if you want to use an ability or use a defense. Everyone's going to be using both. We made a lot of mistakes with the first Dungeon Defenders being only 14 people. Uh, some of those were us being over anxious to get updates out quickly and respond to things that maybe didn't need to be responded to yet. And others of them were just uh, attempts to cater to specific groups of people when we didn't know what, we didn't actually know what the whole community wanted. So that's one of the reasons that we're excited about going free to play. We're going to have a lot more opportunities to see what players are doing and to react a little more slowly and a little more accurately. Uh, I can say that we've learned a lot of lessons from the first game and you can expect us to be applying those lessons into how we balance and expand the sequel. Goodbye Dungeon Defenders Makia community. Uh, I hope you like this video and hopefully we'll be able to do more for you in the future.